City of San Diego's Commission for Arts and Culture has a very unique and innovative approach to public art and we are regarded as a, a model nationwide and have set a precedent in the way we approach artist involvement in city capital uh, building and, and design projects. It is a, a policy that encourages artist involvement in earl as early as possible in the development of a new facility. In the case of the Golden Hill Fire Station and Signifier, the uh, um, fire department had had a previous experience working with an artist and were very receptive and uh, very um, uh, adversarial in having an artist also become involved to you know, enhance the facility and to serve you know, as a link with the community. From the uh, fire department's perspective, when we select an artist to do a piece, we are looking for someone who has a, uh, uh, an ability to be sensitive to the fire department's need, to the community need, and that they can incorporate their ideas and their art to, uh, to the location and, uh, and develop um, their ideas within certain parameters. It's, it's not a person who thinks they have complete free reign, but they do have a lot of uh, ability to, to uh, explore what they'd like to do. We have a, a real simple idea, and that's the inside of the facility belongs to the fire department, the outside of the facility belongs to the community. So, but even that outside has to be sensitive to to the fire needs and, and the maintenance aspect of, uh, of uh, the, its environment. Um, the inside of the fire station needs to function for the mission that we're given. Quick response out to the community, uh, a, a convenient living and an adaptable living environment for the firefighters that are inside. The outside needs to adapt to the community. The community has a plan on what they'd like to see. At Fire Station 11, this was the center of Golden Hill. This was, the community wanted a marquee piece. They wanted a statement that said, this is Golden Hill. And so we were given uh, another challenge as, as to, rather than blending into the community, we were supposed to make a statement for the community. At this particular location, they wanted a building that would be a, a kind of signpost almost that you had entered Golden Hill because 25th Street is a connector to um, 94, the freeway. And of course, Broadway is a connector to downtown. So that corner became very significant. And uh, I think they wanted something that would be like the Hillcrest sign um, that would kind of let you know that you had entered a special place. So we really looked at the corner and tried to figure out how we could recognize that corner as a special place. It's a community that has uh, a lot of Queen Anne Victorian homes. Um, so there are a lot of homes that have corner towers, corner massing. Uh, that was one of the things that we were focused on. There's a Gothic, neo-Gothic church down the street that has a corner steeple. Um, so we, we were really looking for an element at the corner that would be a kind of tower that would represent the, or that would signify entry to the community and would somehow represent to the, the massing of houses and buildings in, in the area. Because the fire station was fully designed, the architects were able to identify a particular piece of land that was then designated for the artist's um, attention. And again, given the, the time frame of the project, we used what we call a nominating process. There are many different ways in which artists are selected through the, the Commission for Arts and Culture, and each one is tailored to the particular needs of the client and the, the, the progress and status of the project. So in the case of the Golden Hill Fire Station, a nominating committee um, convened and identified uh, three artists as finalists and those three artists were invited to be interviewed and they were uh, and Nina Caravaslis was selected as the artist uh, to enter into an agreement with the uh, design team to develop an artwork for that fire station.
I was on the selection committee. And uh, Nina was selected as the artist um, because she presented an attitude towards public art rather than a solution towards this particular uh, opportunity. Uh, she didn't come in with a specific design idea, but she was able to convey the kinds of concerns that would influence her decision-making process. Um, and she did that in a way that was um, engaging and enticing. Rather than tell them, this is what I'd like to do, uh, we all uh, described what our work was like and what our thinking process was like. And then from that conversation, they chose who they thought would be most appropriate for doing the project. Now, the reason I think that that's a wonderful way of doing it is that normally um, a public art person, oh, you, you make proposals for places. A lot of times you make proposals for places you've never even seen. And it doesn't, it's not feasible to go to all of these places or to interview, you know, for a very long time to find out what would be most perfect for that site. So the idea that they hired someone that they felt that everyone was comfortable with and that their thinking process was the way that they liked it, then that enabled me as an artist to go in and spend that time with the firefighters and with the neighbors and the community groups to make sure that the, that the piece that I did was harmonious with all of those people as opposed to a committee then ultimately just picking um, the best one out of a group of uh, quick proposals. One thing that we appreciate is that Nina came to us really virtually from the start and explained to us what she wanted to do, how she wanted to do it, and asked us for any ideas. Um, I think she used some of our feedback and used some of the equipment that we normally maintain, which really made it very easy uh, for the firefighters to maintain the piece. I wanted to use um, things of firefighters because one of the important things to me was that firefighters use this building. It wasn't that I needed to make a huge art statement or that it had to be something about the city, but it had to be something that the firefighters who were there and had to contend with cleaning this piece and making sure that people weren't uh, vandalizing it. They had to really like it. Um, and they like their stuff. You know, they're, they're used to buffing things and they, you know, they like turnbuckles and, and that sort of thing. So I wanted to use their things to, um, to get them to like it. <laughs> After the design work is done and, and all approved, then um, it's a matter of actually making it and coming up with uh, all the solutions to the problems that happen when you start making something that, that you've just really only done drawings and maquettes of. So um, the next thing that happened is that I needed to make the bronze fire hose part. And I had a, a number of different ways to go about that, and I wanted to make sure that I was doing the right sort of even casting process. Um, this one was done as a sample using ram sand, um, and ultimately I didn't go with this because uh, I was very afraid of the uh, seam lines. Now, seam line doesn't seem like that much of a problem, but in um, fabric texture, it is because your eye can just pick it up you know, really quickly. And so I went with a ceramic shell process and I took it to a foundry in New Mexico, to the Shadoni foundry, and because they had very large vats and they could do it in a single pour. And so I, I felt that that would be important to not have any of those seam lines. So now how did I make the pattern for the, the fire hose part, this, you know, kind of thing? I uh, took actual fire hose and I stuffed it, which was no small feat. I mean, it sounds simple enough to say, yes, I stuffed the hose. I tried stuffing the hose with sand. I stuffed the hose with, oh God, foam, all kinds of things. Now, what happens with fire hose is that when it's charged, when the water's going through it, 
it stands out straight like this. And what I was trying to get it to do was to coil around. So ultimately, I uh, shredded carpet pad and I rammed it with these very long, this is 40 feet of hose. I had to ram it and, and get it all packed in there uh, tightly. And then I bonded it to a piece of sauna tube. Then I had to remove all the undercuts because the casting process has to be somewhat smooth. And so I filled all of that with wax and replicated the fibers, uh, all the texture. Then I had to drive it through the desert um, and to New Mexico. Uh, so I had to make not a refrigerator compartment, but I had to enclose this thing and then figure out ways to put ice in it with those space age blankets and then off for a road trip. So I brought that to the Shadoni foundry. And then from there, they made a silicone mold of it. This is the part that starts to get confusing because they need to make a wax replica of, of this fire hose, of the, of the portion of the fire hose that I want. And it has to have a fairly thin wall, like a quarter of an inch wall. So it's a molding process that happens around this wax and they do many dips of uh, like an aggregate that forms around and it makes this thing that they now call the ceramic shell. From there, it's um, heated up in a kiln so that all the wax goes away. And then this little hollow place that used to be the wax is then filled with bronze. And so then there's this um, coiled hose piece. Now from there, then that was shipped, I had to go again to the Shidoni Foundry, make sure that the patination was done the way I wanted it to. Then it was shipped back uh, here to San Diego. Then there's this dished out shape that is with uh, glass mosaic and the flame pattern. So all of those pieces of glass had to be cut. So I cut them and then I ground them with a, you know, a diamond grinder. I sandblasted the back of each piece and I set it down as a mosaic, grouted it. Then there's the uh, center nozzle part, and I had that um, chromed again. So it was a very old nozzle, and there's places in it that is worn, and that was one of the things that I really liked and chose about that particular nozzle. And had it chromed again so that the, so that the glass mosaic could reflect up into the nozzle part. In terms of the integration into the site, um, I took my cues from the architect who took his cues from the community. And the community had a lot of older Victorian buildings. And um, in particular, some tower sort of shapes, some round cylindrical shapes. And um, he chose to use that shape in the building. And I thought that that would be a very nice echo um, in terms of the shapes that I was choosing to use. So anyway, he you know, looked around the neighborhood and, and chose a couple of elements that he thought would be fine. Not trying to recreate uh, an older time, but just to try and blend with the neighborhood in some way. And so I, uh, I thought that the general structure should be along the same lines. I was very cautious to not try and compete with the building I mean, I, I don't like those things that clash too much. So, for instance, the um, pedestal shape that I used for sort of holding the piece up is made out of the green slate, which is the same slate that goes around the building. It gives it a homogenous sort of look. Now, then the other thing that I wanted to do with the piece was to use this principle of the anamorphic lens, and that has to do with uh, reflection and... Um, it was a parlor game of the Victorian era, and I'm sure that there's lots of different, you know, uses for it. But it is a pattern, it's a piece of paper with a swirly kind of pattern on it. And you must put this highly polished cylinder on it, and then it sort of decodes the image. And then you see a picture of uh, someone in a boat or the queen waving or something like that. But you can't tell what it is without this cylinder. And I, not that I wanted to absolutely recreate that, but I wanted something that would use this reflective quality. I went and I got this nozzle, it's a very old nozzle, and started messing around with um, the idea of having things that would re be reflected in there. 
And one of the things that I liked was that it would also reflect the, the viewer's face in it. And so the notion of having flames here that would then sort of be coming up and then sort of surrounding the viewer's face. Now, this is sort of a small thing, but it was one of the things that was amusing to me. I'm not sure that that's something that people would notice sort of right off. That's not the key uh, to the piece. Sculpture has always been somewhat collaborative because it's so big and so heavy and so uh, time, uh, time intensive that, uh, that you do usually have to have more than one person working on it. Um, so the nature of collaboration is, is very strong with doing a public art piece. And you, you have to have some sort of direction, but you have to also be open enough to other people and what their desires are to be able to integrate that into your, into your stuff. I, I don't feel that there should be something that would offend any particular group of people. Um, this could seem as if it was washing out uh, an idea, but the truth is that I think it's, it's better to, to work with everyone. And in this project, I was very fortunate. Everyone was just really lovely to work with. The community groups that I had presented the work to, uh, they had a lot of questions about um, its permanence and its uh, vandalizableness. There's not a word probably for that, but um, how much could be picked off? How much, where does the water drainage go? Uh, what about anti-graffiti coatings? That seemed to be the majority of their, um, their concerns about the piece. They seemed to like it enough visually, that, so that was never part of the dialogue. Now in terms of the community that I've seen now, the people that, um, that I've seen come up to the piece, it has been uh, really good. I, I mean, I haven't had any negative comments, and I've had a lot of people, and in fact, the times that I go back to photograph the piece, there's fingerprints all over the nozzle, which means that there's a lot of people up touching it and that sort of thing. And, and uh, you know, I'm very lucky because it hasn't been vandalized yet, and I'm hopeful that the community cares about it enough that that's, uh, that, that that's not something that will happen. So the basic community that I've seen walking past it has been very positive and happy to have things like that in their neighborhood. It really kind of starts to boost up the neighborhood a bit. Once an artwork is actually installed, we tend to gauge its receptivity by the community based on hearsay, <laughs> based on uh, awards that it may receive, uh, based on the very experience we've had with the fire station in which one experience, <laughs> one positive experience begets another positive experience begets another. And in each case, um, uh, there's, there's real opportunity for it to become self-perpetuating. The, the city's public art program has received 26 awards in five years, and uh, the fact that we have 70 projects in that amount of time also is feedback that we interpret as, as being very favorable in terms of the role that artists have played in the community. I think one of the things I like about it too is that it has different, uh, has different readings depending on how you perceive it. It's one thing if you see it from the street and, and sort of pass it at 30 miles an hour. It's something else if you see it on foot. It's uh, something else, again, if you really approach it and get close to it. Um, you know, you don't really see the reflection of the tile in the nozzle of the hose. You don't read that as fire until you're really very close to the object. So it it's kind of reveals itself slowly. And um, I think it's really successful in that regard. Is the phallic nature of the piece a topic in discussions? Well, calling it a phallic piece, I, I guess from a uh, politically correct uh, point of view, I guess I would say, what, whatever do you mean? Uh, but yeah, from a human nature standpoint, well, yeah, yeah, it, that, that does come up quite a bit. Firefighters will show up, they'll, they'll look at the piece, and a joke will be made. 
Uh, one female firefighter continued to bow to it whenever we would back the apparatus into the station, but, but still, it was, it was a quick joke like, uh, people will joke, and uh, it's more as, well, let's, that, that's really neat. What do you guys know about this? How was it, uh, how, how it constructed? This is really neat. Where'd you get the nozzle? So, there used to be an old fire station sitting here. Now there's a brand new, beautiful new fire station with a piece of art in front of it. Uh, Golden Hill uh, does have a portion of the community that's involved in the arts, but the majority of people know nothing about it. And all of a sudden, they have a beautiful new fire station with a piece of art in front of it. Uh, and, and the art piece is made up of uh, firefighting equipment. Uh, that we, it, it's a good chance for us to get out and talk to the public and kind of explain them about some of the equipment that we use. And they can see this actually been made into a piece of art. The aspects of, of, of art that I think are important to the firefighters and, and interviewing firefighters in the stations is, is the pride factor again. The, you know, they, they don't want a piece out there that somebody's going to come up and wonder constantly, what's that? Why did you waste the money on that? Uh, they want a, a, a piece of art that people can come up and feel good about. And, and when they look at it, they, whether it's, it's whimsical, whether it makes a statement, whether it makes you think, it's something that people walk away feeling better about s that they've seen it than walking up and look at it, at, looking at it and going, what is it? Um, we, we, I guess probably the, the hardest piece to get people to accept is something really abstract because that kind of uh, lends itself to, to more displeasure than, um, than something that they're familiar with and, and something that that is, um, stands away, but sort of blends. Um, in the pieces that we, that we choose, or the artists that we choose, and then the pieces that, that finally are uh, um, installed, we're, we're looking for an artist that can, can do that. And I mean, and it's a big task to give an artist, but um, we've been pretty lucky so far. work that goes in the public realm. Um, I'm not sure that I like to do that all the time. Uh, the, the time length on a project like that, I mean I was lucky with two years. Some people go six, eight years on one project and I, I think that I like to do things that are a little bit more varied. So um, if, if I were to look into the future, yes I'd like to do more public pieces, but I'm also very interested in doing other pieces that are more intimate or have a different type of audience. Um, and I'm interested in that change, so uh, yes, some big projects, some you know private projects. I really like that change to happen for my, for my own sanity in my work. describe what your criteria is for choosing an artist. Certainly in the, the case of Signifier, uh, compatibility hairstyles. <laughs> <laughs>